Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I will do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. And my heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. Never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I told God that I'd be nice about what I'm going to say this morning. Because even though I'm going to do a little bit deeper teaching on something I've taught on before, I, uh, so we have greater understanding of it, after all these years of preaching, I still, feel, I still hear people condemning themselves over everything. And I hear people all the time talking about, if I could only do this better, I could only do that better. And man, I just want to be pleasing to God. All those seem like they're pretty harmless statements, but they're all contrary to the Word of God because I am always pleasing to God. I am always pleasing to God because He's pleased with me, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus did. So He's very happy with me. He loves me. I'm His favorite. And we ought to have that feeling about stuff, so I'm going to talk about that. Uh, and what I said, I told God and I told Debbie I was going to be nice about it because uh, I have watched over the years the churches go through all kinds of little deals. I can remember way back when, when we kept on doing these Jewish march songs and walked around with banners with everywhere because we called that worship. It was a lot of fun. It was also a load of crap. We also, we also did this right here. Now listen, I'm, I said I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do this. <laughs> because I, I'm tired of theatrics. Somebody asked me one time, why is it that, that you call, call, call other people to come up and pray for people? Because I'm not the answer. And because one person doesn't have some kind of great anointing that you have to have, but the truth about it is that the, the Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. But now on the Internet, we want to get 10,000 people praying. We feel like maybe, I don't know if the idea is out of 10,000, maybe one person is effectual. <laughs> but they're all acts is what they are. And, uh, 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 and, and I'm going to try to illustrate this. I'm going to use you because you've seen this. This is what we, we saw in the charismatic, and this is, this is Spirit-filled church. But the reason that I quit praying for people, except I, did, I still pray for people, but, but I have other people pray at the altar calls because of this. I got tired of these theatrics, and I'm going to do this once, even though I'm, I'm probably on the camera, but this right here. Oh, Hallelujah! Praise God. <laughs> and I've watched all these theatrics happen over all these years, and that's what they are. Now, here comes Jesus. Here's how Jesus would do. He'd touch them, and he'd move on. He also didn't spend, you can sit down, you can sit down. He didn't spend 15 minutes praying some long prayer that makes somebody else think that you're highly spiritual because you're praying this long prayer. Because he had faith. I just, I know that I come against a lot of stuff that's done out there, but I'm just tired of all, is anybody else tired of all the theatrics, man? Can we just praise God and have a good time and preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Uh, what I'm going to preach to you this morning, because what I want to do is teach you the word and live an example in front of you, and that's what my job as a pastor is, to feed the flock, not to beat the flock. 
And yet I've heard sermons even on the internet sometimes that are beating the flock and not feeding the flock. And I want you, each time you come here, I want you to be challenged, yes. But I want you to walk out of here feeling better what you did when you came in. Amen? Because God is not just a saying, but it's absolute truth. God is not mad at anyone. He even said in Isaiah that after Jesus came, that he, he turned his anger away and would never be angry again. He's not angry. He's not ticked off at anybody. If you came through that door this morning, and you know that it's a sin to be a drunk, but you are a snot-slinging drunk. Anybody knows what I mean by I say snot-slinging drunk? I know some of you do. Can I tell you this? God's not mad at you. He poured out his wrath upon his own son so that he wouldn't have to pour his wrath out on you. We ought to be glad about that. So the truth about it is there's absolutely nobody in hell today because they're sinners. They're in hell because they haven't accepted Jesus. Amen? That's the whole key. And because people don't know that we're a finished work, uh, they keep on trying to please, and they think that somehow God's not pleased with them because of something. They're, listen, you make mistakes every day. You do. You suck at following commandments. But Jesus was perfect at following commandments. You had not the ability, because you are not an unblemished lamb, you did not have the ability to pay a penalty for your own sins. Because only an unblemished lamb could do that, and Jesus was the only one. Man, if we can get our theology about halfway straightened out, think about how victorious we'll be. Amen? So I t entitled the sermon today, The Real Me. And I'm going to explain body, I'm going to explain spirit, soul, and body to you so we understand a little bit different. It's, it's a lack of understanding in that issue that causes people all the problems. It's through this body that I have that man comes in contact with the material world. You might label the body that part which gives us a world consciousness. Because this is what we touch the world with. Is with our bodies. And so I get a world consciousness. The soul is my uh, uh, mind, will, and emotions, my intellect. It aids us in the present state of existence and the emotions which proceed from the senses. Since the soul belongs to man's own self and reveals his personality, you could call it our self-consciousness. My body is used for world consciousness. My so my mind, will, and emotion is used for self-consciousness. The spirit is that part by which we commune with God and by which we alone are able to apprehend and worship him. Because it tells of our relationship with God, the spirit is called the element God's consciousness. So God dwells in the spirit. Say that. God dwells in the spirit. Self dwells in the soul. Senses dwell in the body. As we mentioned already, the soul is a meeting point of the spirit and body, and there they merge, you know, by his spirit man, uh, uh, holds interaction with the spiritual world and, world and with the spirit of God, both receiving and expressing the power and life of the spiritual realm. Through the body, Man is in contact with outside sensuous world, affecting it and being affected by it. The soul stands between these two worlds. The soul, my mind, will, and emotions, is listening to my spirit and to the spirit of God. It is also listening to the world. I got some voices around me, man. So my soul is also listening to what the world is saying. It's listening to the flesh. It's listening to what the devil has to say. At the same time, I'm in tune with my spirit, which is in tune with the Holy Spirit, so I can hear what God is saying. Now, the truth about it is, is he tells us that there, when I was growing up, I was only told 
that the soul and the spirit were the same thing and that you were just a soul and a, a, a body or a spirit and a body. They thought it was the same thing. If it's the same thing, then why did he say that, uh, why did Paul say that he prays that, that our spirit, soul, and body would all be preserved till the end time? And why in the world does it say that the word of God, in Hebrews uh, 4.12, why does it say the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, able to cut between the soul and the spirit? They're not the same thing. They, there's uh, different Greek words that are used for each of them. But the soul is linked with the spiritual world, through what? Through the spirit. And with the material world, through what? The body. So your problem is your head. Your mind, will, and emotions, your intellect. The spirit cannot, by, by the way, your, the spirit cannot act directly upon the body. It has to have a medium, and that medium is the soul. So your body, your body doesn't just operate. It'd be, it'd be kind of cool if you got saved and the Holy Spirit got you up in the morning, <laughs> rocked in and brushed your teeth, and, you know, personal hygiene stuff, which I'm telling you is still very important. <laughs> and then brought you down to read your Bible, pray, and you didn't have to do any of it because your spirit just naturally moved your body in the right way. It doesn't do that. Your spirit, through the Holy Spirit, affects and, and influences you in the soulless realm, in your mind, will, and emotions, so you can control your body. Amen? The spirit doesn't control your body. The soul does. Your body doesn't do anything by itself. I'm glad of that. So you have decisions to make, and that means understanding this concept means you can't blame the devil, God, or anybody else, you have to take uh, what's happening in your life and say, I'm the problem. I'm the problem. Because I decide. I decide whether I'm going to listen to God or I'm going to listen to what my flesh wants, and I decide what I'm going to do with it. Where do I decide that? In the soulless realm, in the mind, will, and emotions. And... Uh, the soul stands between the spirit and the body, binding these two together. And the spirit can subdue the body, but only through the soul. So that it will obey God. Likewise, the body through the soul cannot draw the spirit into, the loving, uh, into loving the world more than God. Why not? Because my spirit is made up of the very seed, 1 Peter 1, 23, made up of the very uh, incorruptible seed of the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So it's impossible for my spirit to sin. Impossible. The silliest discussion I think I ever had with a minister is the one that, that took occasion with that and said, I don't believe that's true. I said, then, then I tell you what, sin against me, but don't use your mind or your body. Well, he said, how would I do it? I said, you can't. Your spirit can't sin. It has to be a manifestation of what you're thinking or doing with your body. So the battleground is always the mind, isn't it? The soul lying between uh, joins two together and takes their character to be its own. The soul man is possible for the spirit and the body to communicate and to cooperate with each other. The work of the soul is to keep these two in proper order. The body may be subjected to the spirit, and the spirit may govern the body through the soul. Man's prime factor is definitely the soul. The, the problems that we have is because we have unrenewed minds. Through the, and we haven't done that. It looks to the spirit to give what it's received from the Holy Spirit to, and in order that the soul, after it's been perfected, may transmit what has been attained in the body then the body to you know uh, this is more of this this bad religious teaching when I was growing up I heard so much preaching about God sending a healing from where where is he going to send this healing from where does God live he lives in us doesn't he so does healing have to come from heaven? Or is it already in my body? 
Are, are you getting any of this? So it's simple biblical teaching, but because of wrong teaching, we have wrong beliefs. And I hear people say, I just pray, pray that God will heal you. Well, God's already provided healing. Well, pray that his spirit uh, move. I pray that the spirit comes into the church. Uh, the spirit can't be anywhere else but the church. King David said, where in the world would I go where your spirit isn't? If I, if I go up the heavens, you're there. I go into the depths, you're there. Wherever I go, that your spirit's there. The problem with the move of the spirit isn't whether or not God's here, but whether or not we're, we are listening to him. The body is the lowest of the three part of mankind. It's really our dumb brother. It doesn't do anything our mind doesn't tell it to do. The body is the outer shell of the soul. And the soul is the outer shell of the spirit. Reason when the scripture says it doesn't say body, soul, and spirit, it always says spirit, soul, and body. The spirit transmits its thought to the soul, and the soul exercises the body to obey the spirit's order. I want you to get this in your head so you quit blaming everybody in the world about what goes on inside of your life. I've had people for years when I was doing prison ministry all the time, a guy said, Well, you don't know how I was raised. I said, I don't give a flip how you raised. You're in here for not what your parents did, but what you did. Now, before the fall of man in the garden, the spirit controlled the whole being through the soul. The power of the soul is most substantial since the spirit and the body are merged there and make it the site of man's personality and influence. Before man committed sin, the power of the soul was completely under the dominion of the spirit. But after man sinned, it really messed us up, didn't it? The spirit cannot itself act upon the body. It can only do so through the medium of the soul. We see that in Luke 1, 46 and 47. It says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Why does my spirit rejoice in God my Savior? That's all it can do. It's made of the very seed of God. In order for the spirit to govern the soul, it's got to give its consent. And, and, and that's where my, there's, there, there's where my battleground is. I've got, to, I've got to allow the Holy Spirit to have its way inside of my life. I've got, to, I've got to listen to my spirit, which is constantly in tune with the Holy Spirit, and quit listening to things that are going out here. When people come up and ask me, I don't know what to do. I've got a decision to make. I say, well, ask God. Well, I know, but what, I'm not God. Well, I just wanted your opinion. My opinion don't mean anything. The, the Bible doesn't say the righteous man's steps are ordered by the pastor. The righteous man's steps are ordered by the Lord. Now, what is the disconnect between hearing God and hearing people? The disconnect is in the soulless realm. We've got to listen to what God says. He's speaking to us all the time. We have free will, man. That sucks. Because <laughs> we don't always use free will in the way that we should. Man is not an automaton that turns according to God's will. Rather, man has sovereign power to decide for himself. God desires that the spirit, being the noblest part of man, should control the whole being. Yet the will, the crucial part of individuality, belongs to the soul. It's the will which determines whether the spirit, the body, or even itself is to rule. Newly born again Christians, now listen to me, New, newly born again Christians often become vulnerable to discouragement, doubt, unbelief, because they don't understand that the change took place in their spirit. And the rest of the Christian life is renewing their mind to believe and release what God has already put on the inside of them. Everything I need from God dwells on the inside of me right now. And I release that 
in the solar shrimp. You know what? I don't release it. I don't release it by saying, if I could only have Pastor Bob pray for me and put his hands on my head, then, oh, hallelujah, then I'd have it. Do I, do I look like I get sick of charismania? I do. And we've been involved in most of it <laughs> over the years. They accept Jesus as their Savior. Then the next morning they wake up to find themselves the same old ugly person in the mirror. Married to the same spouse with the same problems, the same sickness, same mountain of debt and everything else. So they go, did anything really happen to me? Why? Because they're not trained yet. And because they're not trained yet, they're still judging everything in the soulless realm and not listening to the Spirit. And so they're still looking and say, well, if, if, if I, there was a real change and all of this would be over with. Well, no, it won't be over with. When you just look in the physical realm, it's easy for people to conclude, well, that didn't work. <laughs> Maybe the Word of God isn't true. God didn't change me because everything's still the same. In fact, many times your problems intensify once you're born again. That's, that's just the devil throwing everything he has at you because you're no longer on his side and he wants to stop your witness. He'll lie to you. But you need to be, you need to listen to what the Holy Spirit said. If you're not careful, you become confused and think, I'm not sure anything really happened. The new man, though, has been created in righteousness and true holiness, according to Ephesians 4. You're not evolving. Now listen to me. You're not evolving into change because in your spirit, you're already changed. You're already changed. The problem is, you are just looking at who you are in the physical realm rather than looking at who you are in the spirit realm. You're already accepted by God. You can't read your Bible enough, give enough money to the church. You can try. I won't care. <laughs> you, you, you can't work enough inside the church, sing enough in the praise team, do any of those things to somehow make you accepted. You are already accepted. Jesus became sin so you could become righteous. The greatest trade I ever made. 2 Corinthians 5.21 and the King James said, He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus became what you were so you could become what he is. Is that good or what? He became what you were so you could become what he is. He took your sin and gave you his righteousness. Most of the church today acknowledges that Jesus paid the price for their sin, but they don't really believe that they became righteous. There's where the disconnect it is. If you believed you're already righteous, you wouldn't spend your time talking about your latest failure. Well, I was reading my Bible every day, and I went a week without reading my Bible. Oh, my God, i got to start all over again. With what? If the perfection of Christ is not good, for you, uh, good enough for you, I don't know where you're going to go. If you believe the first half of the verse, that he took all your sin, you ought to believe the second part, that you're righteous. God doesn't look at you the, the way you look at yourself. And he, he looks upon my spirit. He sees Jesus here. Most people pray, oh God, I pray. I failed you miserably again. Can you love me? Show mercy upon me. And I think when you pray like that, God the Father turns to God the Son and says, I thought you died for him. Yeah, I did, but evidently it's not enough, Dad. I thought you gave him all of your righteousness. I did. They're perfect in your sight. But they don't know it. And I spent 30 years in ministry trying to convince people of that very fact. Because it's the hardest thing for people to get inside. 
They don't recognize the truth that the performance of their bodies and souls, either good or bad, has absolutely no bearing on whether or not God accepts them. God doesn't accept me for what I do for him. He accepts me because of what he did for me. If you're born again, it doesn't matter if you've rebelled or just aren't everything you should be. God sees you as righteous and truly holy because he's looking at your spirit. In Ephesians 1, 5, and 6, is one of my favorite verses, it says, Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. I love that statement. Why did God save you? It was his good pleasure to. He didn't have the attitude, well, I guess I'm going to have to save them. <laughs> They're jacked up. No, it, it was his good pleasure to do that. He said, to the praise and the glory of his grace, wherein he made us accepted in the beloved. Accepted is more than just tolerated. And there are Christians who the greatest thing they can think about themselves is somehow that God tolerates them. He's literally pleased with you. Turn to your neighbor and say, God's pleased with me. God loves me. I'm his favorite. <laughs> you might not be pleased with the shape your mind or body is in, but God sees you in the spirit. When you were born again, you became a brand new creature, a new creation, and he's pleased with his workmanship. Ephesians 1, 6, that word accepted, is the same Greek word translated highly favored in Luke 1, 28. When the angel Gabriel came and uh, talked to Mary, he said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou. There's only two places in the Bible that's used. One in Ephesians, one in Luke. And that you're blessed, and you're highly favored. Somebody, I remember a long time ago, this guy told me, he said, Oh, man, there was something different about Mary. She was highly favored. She was highly favored because she got to give birth to the Christ child. Not only that, let me tell you something. Not only are you accepted by God, but you are preserved and protected by God. Once you believe, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 1.13, it says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed. In other words, when you first came to Christ, it, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Your born-again spirit was created in righteousness and true holiness as Jesus is, so became your spirit right here in this world. You became one with the Lord. You are accepted and you're preserved by the Holy Spirit. Do you remember when, maybe some of you do it, I started to say when Grandma canned thing, preserves and stuff, when a woman cans food, she seals a jar with paraffin. Makes an airtight seal that preserves and protects the food within Airborne impurities are prevented from getting inside and causing the food to rot and spoil. In Ephesians 1.13, when you were born again, your spirit was immediately encased, vacuum-packed by the Holy Ghost for the purpose of preservation. And when you fail in any area of your life after being saved, the rottenness, uncleanness, and defilement that comes to your body and soul cannot penetrate your spirit because it is sealed by the Holy Spirit. Are you glad about that today? The Holy Spirit seal keeps the good in and the bad out. God doesn't look at sin the way uh, people do anyway. A lot of people think about sin, about the bad things you do, but did you know according to the Word of God, it's not only about the bad things you do, it's about the good things you don't do. James 4, 17 says, To him that knoweth the good to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So even knowing what's good to do and not doing it is sin. So those people that think they're living in this life with no sin are just full of themselves. Because not only are you doing some things you shouldn't do, there's some things you should do that you don't do. Aren't you glad you're sealed by the Holy Spirit? No one loves their wife or their husband the, the same way that the, that the Bible says they ought to. I come close to my honey baby sugar doll, but... 
No one is as passionate in ministering to others as they should be. None of us meditates on the things of God as much as we should. So according to God's definition of sin, everyone constantly falls short. If you don't understand that the Holy Spirit encased your born-again spirit, your conscience will eventually give you the impression that you've lost your righteousness and holiness. Your conscience, with its knowledge of right and wrong, constantly bears witness to your mind about your thoughts and actions. If you aren't careful, you allow the knowledge of your failures to affect you. That's what you'll dwell on. You won't dwell on the, what God says about you. you dwell on what you think are failures in your life. You think, well, I, when I was born again, God gave me a brand new start, but I failed him now. You may confess, try hard, get back to where you feel like uh, you're all right. Now I'm back on track, everything's fine, but it won't be long before your conscience shows you something else. If you go up and down like this day after day, year after year, after a while you'll think, well, what's the use? 1 John 3, 9, one, another one of my favorite scriptures. It says, whoever's been born of God, this is in the New King James Version, whoever's been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's been born of God. Now, some of the versions have even changed the wording of that to say something false. Some of the versions actually say today, he that is born of God cannot habitually sin. Because that's how people preached it. But that's not what it says. If you interpret 1 John 3, 9 to mean you cannot habitually sin, if you're truly born of God, then nobody would qualify because we all habitually sin. The only way this can be preached is to say, well, you can't habitually sin, do the big sins, but the little ones, yes, you can habitually sin. If you understand spirit, soul, and body, the interpretation of 1 John 3, 9 becomes obvious. Your spirit is the only part of you that's been born of God. Your body was born of your mom and dad. But your spirit was born of God. And it does not commit sin. Part of the preservation of your spirit is the fact that it cannot sin. Is everybody listening to this? Am I the only one who thinks this is good this morning? Your soul and your body have been purchased, but not yet redeemed. That'll happen. Therefore, your spirit cannot sin, even though your body and soul can. This means your performance doesn't affect the purity and the holiness of your spirit. The truth is pivotal to your relationship. You might... You might do better than other certain people, but your own conscience will condemn you. Eventually, you know, it reminds me of the story when we're talking about righteousness of God. Uh, and we were reading in a book called Amazing Grace, which is now called The, the Greatest Gift. And uh, it talks about people trying to become righteous by what they do. And he, sa and he said, you know, two people might leave the, co the beach in California and decide they're going to so swim to Hawaii. Well, one person make it will make it further than the other, but neither one of them are swimming to Hawaii. <laughs> and that's the way it is when people try to work their way to heaven. The truth about it is, is that one may do better than another, but neither one of them can work their way to heaven. Our salvation is a free gift. Our righteousness, we didn't pay for it, Jesus did. I'm preaching this to you this morning because I want to get you to the place where you start believing how good you are in God's sight, because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If a person belie believes that they are a poor loser, can't do anything quite right for God, you'll live your life that way. But if you see yourself as the righteousness of God in Christ, you'll live your life that way. The righteousness you were born again with stays uncontaminated. Since God is a spirit, he always deals with you spirit to spirit. No matter how you're performing, you can always approach him because of the perfection of Christ. I got a few questions. I'm going to tell a story and we'll end this. But are you self-condemning? How long will you continue doubting God and what he's done for you? 
How long will you argue with God about your perfection? Ask yourself, why am I bound and determined to condemn myself and think less of myself than I should? Be honest with yourself. How do you believe God feels about you? Is he pleased with you? Is he disappointed in with you? What is it that you believe about God? What do you base those feelings on? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Believe God in your heart and you'll soar like an eagle. I'm going to tell this story. I know you've heard this before. I've preached it before. But in the book, The Pursuit of Excellence by Ted Engstrom, it opens with a folktale gleaned from the North American High Plains Indians. The story tells of a warrior who found an eagle's egg that had tumbled out of its nest. Curious about what would happen, he took the egg and placed it in the nest of a prairie chicken. The eaglet hatched with the brood of prairie chicken chicks and grew up with them. All his life, the, founding, the foundling eagle, thinking he was a prairie chicken, did what prairie chickens do. He scratched in the dirt for seeds and insects to eat. He clucked and cackled. And when he flew, he flew with a brief thrashing of wings and a flurry of feathers no more than a few dozen yards at a time, never more than three or four feet off the ground. After all, that's how prairie chickens fly. That's how he flew. Years passed, and after the foundling eagle grew very large, very powerful, though he certainly didn't look like a prairie chicken, he acted like one. One day he happened to look up and saw a magnificent bird far above the prairie grass. Hanging with a graceful majesty on the powerful wind currents, his sword was scarcely a beat of its strong wings. What a beautiful bird, exclaimed the foundling eagle to a fellow prairie chicken. What is it? He said, that's an eagle, the greatest of birds, chucked the prairie chicken in reply. But don't give him a second thought. You could never be like him. So the foundling eagle went back to scratching for seeds and bugs and never gave the eagle a second thought. And he died thinking he was a prairie chicken. The moral of this story is that you become what you believe you are. When you look at yourself in the mirror, what do you see? Do you see a prairie chicken? Or do you see an eagle? How do you believe God sees you? Because how you live the Christian life depends on how you answer those questions. Man, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. He is not disappointed in you. I'm so glad he didn't set up a program where if I did everything right, he'd like me. Because I'd be in a lot of trouble. But, but when I found out that he loves me in the same way that he loves his own son, Jesus, because I look just like Jesus to the Father, that sets me free to live for him. Do you receive that from the pastor this morning? Let me have.